Hey everyone, welcome to our 2021 Outdoor Adventure Show virtual presentation. My name is Brad Jennings. And I'm Leah Jennings. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about our expedition we did in northwestern Ontario down the Throat River, retracing a long lost fur trade route and exploration route really in the heart of a wilderness area. One of our favorite trips we've done to date so far. Why would we go to Northwestern Ontario? Well, Northwestern Ontario is really a mecca of paddling and being in Ontario, we're really blessed to have quite a selection of canoe routes. I mean, you could spend a lifetime paddling throughout the province and never get to experience all the waterways. But we find ourselves continually going back to Northwestern Ontario year after year. It's just a vast area of interconnected lakes where the possibilities of paddling are purely endless. So this is one of our favorite guidebooks to help us plan a lot of our trips. It's called uh, the Canoe Atlas of the Little North. It's all these old canoe routes from fur trading and expiration days and uh, all the routes and everything in here is written in partnership with the local First Nations. So it's really, really interesting and has a lot of really good stories and insight into the land up in Northern Ontario. So yeah, in consulting the Canoe Atlas of the Little North, I did find a couple plausible routes throughout Northwestern Ontario that was fitting our timeline. I also reached out to Albert from Gold Seekers. Gold Seekers Outfitting does a lot of outfitting out in Woodland Caribou region. They also offer shuttle services and lots of expertise for some of those far northern routes. So the Throat River was one of the routes that I had seen in the book and there's not really much details because it's seldom paddled. The last paddler to kind of go through the headwaters that has at least shared their experience was over a decade ago. So there wasn't a lot of information to go on and the majority of the information we went off of was just from the topographical map and the satellite uh, imagery that I saw pre-trip to try to scout this route. So one of the great things about the area that we were in, which was just north of Red Lake, Ontario, is that we were able to get to a really wild area by just going about 80 kilometers down one of the most northern logging roads in the area, jump onto a river, and from there we could go all the way up into the far north of Ontario, where we basically didn't see anything or any form of development except for Cat Lake First Nation. Um, and we were able to basically do um, a remote northern trip without having to fly in, we were able to still drive to our drop off and our pickup area. Now that being said, our travel is north of any of these logging roads in development, but to facilitate a trip like this, we had to paddle 450 kilometers. <laughs> so our goal was to do a long trip. We like to move every day. We like to see the landscape change before our eyes and we're not averse to doing uh, long drawn out distances. So our timeline being anywhere from 16 to 19 days if we got windbound to do 450 kilometers it's quite a lot on your daily kilometers uh, especially when you factor in things such as weather, um, headwinds, storms, low water conditions, bushwhack portages. You run the gauntlet of unknowns when you're doing a route that really has no information and it's more expedition style. So after chatting with Albert and pouring over the maps, the plan finally came to fruition. We packed all our gear up, we dehydrated all our own meals, and we headed off to Northwestern Ontario and started journeying down a dusty logging road <laughs> to a put in on the Shabamini River. Now the Shabamini River is quite a small, narrow, little river that flows into Shabamini Lake. And as soon as we left that logging row behind and we were paddling, you know, it really kind of sunk in that now we're off on, on quite a, a wilderness journey. There's absolutely nothing but wild lands around us here and it's only going to get more and more wild as we journey further and further into the interior. So paddling the Shabamini River was quite an easy and enjoyable experience. There was only two portages to really contend with, but we got a taste of what we were in store for when we got out to Shabamini Lake. Now this is a large windswept lake and we faced the brunt of headwinds as soon as we reached an opening there. And this was gonna be a taste of that next section of our journey because really our trip was split up into three distinct sections. 
The first part of our journey would be large lake travel as we made our way through the Cat River system. After that, we would have a height of land section where we would cross the watershed divide from the Cat River system into the Throat River system. This is characterized by shallow rocky streams, dense jack pine and spruce forests, and lots of bog and fens. After that, on the final third portion of our journey would be the Throat River proper, where the river starts to pick up water and flushes downstream towards the Barrens system. So as Brad mentioned, when we got into Shabamini Lake, it was very, very, very windy and we found this tiny little island that we basically cut out a sight on and sure enough, lo and behold, we found our first uh, piece of evidence that we were on an old fur trading route and exploration route. While we were trying to make a fire pit, Brad found a very, very old trap that was just kind of buried on, amongst all the the trees and what had what had been growing on the on the island. So that was our first little taste of history that we knew that we were kind of in, going in the right direction, and uh, it was a sign of what we were about to see. Now the area is steeped in history. It was subject to uh, an 1800s expedition by Dowling, and then was subsequently used by fur traders throughout the 1800s and 1900s. So paddling through an area that had been utilized so much historically, you know, we really, we were really curious if we would see any traces of the past and any glimpses that we got were a reminder of the deep culture and history that uh, really characterized this region. The first bit of our journey was passing through these large windy lakes. Now, thankfully for us crossing Birch Lake, it was flat, it was glassy, it was an enjoyable paddle. But as we made our way down towards the large lakes on the Cat River system, uh, the winds picked up. Now, thankfully for us, they were in our favor. The weather can shift quite suddenly on the, in, in this area, especially when the wind shifted and we started having a very strong southerly wind. And there's no uh, campsites marked on any of the maps. So you can't just assume that you'll be able to find a really nice campsite easily. True to form, right when the weather started to turn, we were on Kapikik Lake and we stumbled across uh, a really nice site actually tucked in on a big beach. So we were able to snag it right away and uh, just get our tarp set up in time right before the skies opened and just pouring rain happened. But again, we had been expecting to go around another bend and find a really good site, but I was pretty insistent that we just stop because we knew we found one. And I'm glad that we did because the next morning when we were leaving and we passed where we thought there'd be a good site, absolutely no site whatsoever there. So that was kind of a theme throughout this trip also was where are we gonna sleep tonight and will it be an enjoyable experience? So progressing through these lakes, we really tried to get up early and push as far as we could go. We tried to get as many kilometers behind us as we could when the weather was in our favor. So then we entered into the last portion of our really big lake travel, which was through the Cat Lake system. And on this one day, we were able to accomplish 50 kilometers in just one day of paddling. It was still about a 12 hour day of paddling from about seven in the morning until about seven o'clock at night. But what we were able to accomplish in that day was really, really helpful because then the weather shifted completely the next day and we likely would have only been able to do a fraction of what we had accomplished. And we wanted to get to that next part in the trip, which was about to become the uh, height of land portion of the trip. We had already gone over 150 to 200 kilometers and we'd only done about a third of our time. So we really tried to get those big lakes behind us as fast as possible. So after ascending the Cat River system, the real unknown and exciting part of our trip begins. Now we will be going up the Kamagish system and the Quintosh system until we get to Sleep Lake. And beyond Sleep Lake is the height of land that will take us into the Throat River system, which we will now paddle downstream down to the Barrens. However, this was the largest unknown of the trip. Because it's a height of land, it's subject to low waters. You're also looking at potential for long slogs. Because you have smaller streams, you have a larger distance to travel overland. There were a couple ways to get to the Throat River, at least on paper from the Cat River system, but all of them looked like they hadn't been used in a long, long time. So 
looking at the maps, I found what looked to be the best bet. I poured over aerial images and satellite images to land on the connection between Sleep and Tinker Lakes because it was characterized by a lot of large open bogs and it was generally flat as well too. So we set off thinking that the crossing from Sleep to Tinker Lake would be the hardest part of it. However, as we worked our way up the Kamagish system and into the Quintosh Creek system, we were um, unfortunately a little bit surprised. Yeah, so we eventually get to um, the area called Quintosh Creek, which was supposed to have a 500 meter portage on the left hand side of the creek. However, a massive blowdowns occurred in the area and the entire portage was decimated. So there wasn't even an option to necessarily bushwhack the 500 meters because the amount of blowdowns in the area was just so dense that we could barely walk five feet without, you know, encountering a blowdown up around my chest or like Brad's waist. Um, and it just wasn't gonna be feasible. So what we ended up doing was we ended up going through the creek. It is actually a slot canyon with walls that are about 10 to 15 feet in certain areas. But luckily for us, the water was low when we were going and we ended up just having to push the canoe up a creek through a slot canyon that had quite a big drop at times, very slowly and painfully. Get the boat up the creek, but that was definitely one of our biggest unexpected challenges. We were losing light really quickly and it was getting late into the day and we just needed to get to sleep late so that we could set up camp rest because we knew we had a big day ahead of us because it was going to be the height of land crossing. So as we got up the next morning, we started to make our way down Sleep Lake, which was actually quite a very beautiful lake. And we had no idea whether there'd be any existing portage when we got there. So we slowly made our way down, kind of poking into the woods every now and then to see if we what we thought may be an entrance to a portage. And then lo and behold, right at the end of the lake, there was a massive, well-marked, well-used portage. The boreal forest holds trails really nicely and there was a perfect long two kilometer portage waiting for us that was well-marked with big blazes. It was pretty, pretty clear the entire way as well. And we were able to save ourselves from what we thought was gonna be about a two kilometer bushwhack through a dense boreal forest, but again, got really lucky. But to Leah's point as well, the boreal does hold trails nicely, especially in this section of Northwestern Ontario, where the ground is covered in a rich, thick layer of sphagnum moss. If trees don't fall down around, the sphagnum moss holds that nice depression of a trail for you know, it could be 50 to 100 years before it starts to fill in again. Now, the good thing about the headwaters is because it's a highly acidic, low-lying region, there's a lot of small, stunted spruce trees and tamaracks, so you don't necessarily have the larger jack pines that are subject to wind throw, like around the rocky area of Quintosh Creek. However, after we did the height of land, the next little section to get to Tinker Lake which the only bit of information I had suggested that there was numerous small obstructions, rocky, shallow rapids. It actually proved to be a lot more difficult than we envisioned, and it was a lot harder than crossing the height of land itself. So as we're paddling along through these headwater lakes, we are again buffeted by a deluge of cold, cold rain. Unfortunately for us, temperatures were far below seasonal, but this is what happens when you go to some of these farther northern reaches of northwestern Ontario. It's not all sunshine and rainbows. <laughs> the weather is subject to changes and you can get cold blasts of arctic air and without warning you can go for weeks of say 10 degree weather when it should be around 22 degrees and you can get down to freezing at night even in the middle of July and August. So unfortunately for us the weather was turning, it was cold, it was miserable and we were slogging. But as we're working our way through these headwater streams, in and out of the canoe, in and out of the canoe, dragging, walking, lifting, there's no clear trails to work our way through the bush, and it's just a struggle. We'll paddle maybe 100 meters, then get out of the boat, drag it over a shallow rapid, and if we can't drag it over that rapid, then we'll bushwhack through the, uh, the forest adjacent to it, 
all in an attempt to make it down to the lake. That day to go through the height of land, we ended up only paddling eight kilometers, but portaging 11. So it was very, very long, strenuous day. As we started down Tinker Lake and entered the Throat River proper, we definitely were faced with a full gauntlet of challenges. The low water that we had seen on those upper streams was still persistent. The bush was even nastier and to make matters worse, we had those on and off scattered showers throughout the day as well too. So you're portaging through thick dense bush full of blowdowns. You're going around streams that have nary a trickle of water in them and they're pretty much just boulder gardens. We're cutting through blowdowns, we're lifting through log jams. The day just wears on and on and on. And for the majority of the day, we were going slower than two kilometers an hour. We caught ourselves many times thinking, how, how the heck did anyone travel this, you know, a hundred years ago? Any, any semblance of an old trail that would have bypassed this had been long gone. And it just showed that no one really ventures through this area. But at, at the same time, that was sort of the wilderness feel that we were looking for here as well too. We wanted to find something that challenged us both physically and mentally, yet at the same time was ultimately rewarding. So now from Whitelaw Lake downstream, we're entering a, a more well-traveled portion of the Throat River system. And now by well-traveled, I mean that it's used by one or two people every couple of years versus maybe one person every one or two decades. So paddling down from Whitelaw Lake, the Throat River tumbles over a series of waterfalls and rapids. And this was a highlight for me as well too in the planning process was what sort of rapids are we going to encounter on a trip? And when you're paddling a river from its headwaters down to its confluence, you really get to see the river pick up both in terms of width and volume and speed. So it was really interesting to see the rapids turn from riffles, swifts, and unrunnable rocky boulder gardens to class one, two, and three. Uh, but with that too also brings potential hazards. You're running through rapids in a wilderness environment where your chance of rescue, immediate rescue rather, is slim to none. You're gonna to have to call in a helicopter or a float plane to evacuate you. There's a greater deal of caution when approaching even a minor class two rapid or what seems to be a, a straightforward class three rapid. So we always take the time to, to scout, but on a trip like this, you know, we weigh, weigh the pros and cons of some of these runs. There were a couple of rapids that I would normally be very eager to run and, and, and paddle, um, but because it was just the two of us in one canoe, should an issue happen, uh, we're essentially stranded out there. And, and something did happen. We were paddling a class three, the first big rapid of the trip. It, it was short, but a good two drops bypassing a, a small set of falls. Um, there was a good run on the one side, but as we came down, the stern smashed into a jagged rock. And that impact caused the rear skid plate to come detached in one section from the hull of the canoe and led to a bunch of gel coat issues. So it was a bit of a surprise when we pulled up to camp and I flipped over the, the hull and saw, you know, all this damage. But thankfully, we do pack stuff to fix canoes in, in situations like this. In this instance, having big cracks and big openings of the weave and knowing that we had larger rapids ahead of us was a bit unnerving. Fortunately for us, the next morning we woke up and it was tack enough that it was going to suffice for the remainder of the trip. And of course, we ran some larger stuff later in the trip and happy to report that there was no other damage to the hull whatsoever. So approaching the later half of our trip, the river is picking up more volume and uh, we're gonna start to leave behind some of these larger lake systems. We also knew that there was going to be a section of waterfalls and more intense rapids. When you get to some of these obstacles such as large waterfalls and, and portages don't exist, you're, you're really thrust into a situation where you know, you're gonna have to, to push through and, and use your skills to overcome those areas. 
You were hit with a bunch of really big, long, cascading waterfalls that were uh, obviously very unrunnable, but they were just very big, long sets that were supposed to have portages um, nearby, but it proved that they did not. And because of all the rain that we had had, all the water that was once low water is now super high water because it's almost at a flooding stage because of the just the sheer amount of rain that the exit out of the throat onto what should be a portage was incredibly dangerous and really quite scary. We started off with one big waterfall that we had to pour bushwhack portage around to then do another set of a big long bushwhack portage around another set of a big set of falls. And at that point in the river, it was an S bend and we, we could see and scout a set of rapids that we, we thought was about a class two. But once we came off that rapid, it would be around a corner and we knew there was another rapid around the other corner. It was a ledge class three and it was pretty intense and it was definitely a sign of what was to come further down the river. And that's just the thing, as you're going through some of these unknown areas, your whitewater skills have to be up to the task. Because the water was flowing so high, we had over nine days straight of continuous rain. It never went more than 18 hours without rain. And we had a couple days where it just poured all day. So all that water is funneling into the river and it's rising and rising and rising. So the rapids are close to that, you know, mid spring level and flooding out some of the landings like Leah is saying, but even trying to scout some of these rapids as well is quite the, the tricky task. But as we continue down river, we, we pass through an area where Pekanjikum First Nation starts to travel upstream towards Zeller Lake, which they use uh, for some of their hunting and fishing grounds. And along the way, now we're starting to see more signs of use. So instead of doing bushwhack, sloggy portages, we're coming across portages that uh, have signs of use by the First Nations. Um, and, and you can tell that they visit these areas, you know, annually as well too. And at this point in time, the river is getting quite wide. It's characterized by fen lands on each side. It's very flat, but it's pierced by these rapids that just seemingly appear out of nowhere. And the river just drops. The horizon just drops completely. And one of our favorite campsites on the trip were just one of the short portages where the river just tumbled over this series of cascading ledges where the river basically just pours off the shield. And that would kind of characterize the lower stretch of the river where you're paddling through these large swaths of flat open treed areas and then you just kind of appear into these these rapids some of which you can run some of which you can't so you'd be paddling along and it's completely flat and all you can hear is this big rumbling of what would be either a rapid or a waterfall and you're looking around like where the heck is this coming from and then they just kind of appear out of nowhere so one of the nice things about this portion of the trip was um, because it was on such low uh, flat land, we weren't often sleeping on rock outcrops. We were mostly kind of in the bush a little bit, sleeping on really thick moss. So it was like the best sleep of your entire life. So the final portion of our journey, we got down to the Barrens River, a that's a story canoe route that uh, continues to flow out to Lake Winnipeg. And we came across McCamby Falls, which is a gorgeous, waterfall that seemingly appears out of absolutely nowhere again you can hear the the rumble of the of the water pouring over that rock ledge from a couple kilometers away and then as you come up it just seemingly drops off and there's there's no one around and it, it, it's quite the quite the experience that night we got down to Barron's lake and, and enjoyed probably the nicest night in, in about a week and a half of, of paddling out there. We had a gorgeous sunset, nice warm breeze, and we were able to reflect on, you know, what a journey it had been, retracing history, but also paddling a river from its headwaters down to its confluence uh, to the both of us was, was quite the moving experience because you get the trials and tribulations of those headwaters, which as any paddler who's ever, you know, attempted a, a trip as such too, where you're going through height of land crossings, they can attest to the fact that it's, it, it's a challenging, it's an arduous, it's a, it's, it's a hard ordeal, but it's that much more rewarding once you've persevered and struggled through it and watched the river change before your very eyes, stroke after stroke. It's, it's quite a magical experience to see it evolve before you.
Yeah, it was almost like in a way that we got to like learn the personality of the river from right from it's basically its birth all the way till its end. And it's a really intimate experience getting to know and understand the water so well. It brings a certain connectivity with the with the landscape around you that I don't think I had ever experienced before in all the other trips that we had done. So it was really it was a unique experience and something that I look forward to doing again in the future. This trip was definitely a, a series of firsts for us. You know, it was uh, the longest trip Brad and I have ever done, both kilometer-wise and length and time. It was also the trip where all of our luck with having incredible weather ran out, where we went from always having the most beautiful weather on all of our trips to literally having the worst weather every single day. But you know, it was just another opportunity for us to continually build our skills and explore another portion of the province that you know we love so much. So it was it was a really wonderful. Experience. Experience. Well, that's it for our uh, digital presentation here. Hope you really enjoyed our um, story about paddling through northwestern Ontario's throat river system. It was an enjoyable trip for the both of us, and we definitely look forward to getting back to northwestern Ontario and, and paddling more of its waters. We can't wait to share the story with you all um, in our upcoming video. Far in the northern reaches of Ontario and Manitoba lies a vast, unspoiled wilderness sprawling for over a million square kilometers. First Nations, explorers, and fur traders have long paddled the storied waters of this remote and unforgiving region. This is the Little North. This would be a trying journey through untamed waters, guided by whispers of the past and grappling with the challenges of the present. We set out to retrace over 450 kilometers of paddling history. I started feeling a little disheartened and nervous about just how hard this part of the trip was going to be. I have a feeling we're going to be entering into the type 2 fun portion of this trip. Just got slowed right down. I think we're going about one kilometer an hour. And the throat's going to be challenging at any time of the year for you. Friggin' wet, it's raining, damn miserable. There's literally nowhere else you can go, so you have to kind of just get over it and go down and keep a cool head about you, have your moment, and then just sort of push through, I suppose. When hard things are put in front of you, you really don't have an excuse to quit, so you just have to kind of keep moving forward. Throat River is full of challenges, hard times, tricky weather, tricky situations. So we definitely smashed into a huge rock. So we're gonna reinforce it, do some field repairs. Wilderness up here in northwestern Ontario is just incredible and just watching a river turn from a small stream to a giant, powerful, deep and wide body of water is quite a moving experience. Thanks for watching all. Check out Explore the Backcountry for more.